looking like this. These lights are a little bright, but I guess we need them for the cameras. So, uh, welcome to the Mercury Jamboree. You, uh, I, I think I, I've learned that it's best to define what the meeting is about. This one is about dental amalgams, as they're commonly called. They are fillings made with mercury. Half of the material in the filling is mercury. So more accurately, they are called mercury fillings. And uh, just so we all know what we're talking about. The, uh, so I, uh, first of all, I just would give you a little background on how it is that this came about. This uh, citizens assembly to figure out a way to stop the use of mercury fillings. Last year, Environment Canada, working with Health Canada, held consultations with the public to advise the new regulations on products that contain mercury. The international community is working to reduce and stop the use of uh, mercury in, in products. So there are you know, probably people are familiar with things like compact, compact fluorescent light bulbs that have mercury in them. So it's, it's getting rid of those products. I was very perplexed when the recommendations from the committee came out that mercury fillings are to be exempted from the regulations. So the, that is the single largest source of mercury. That if you have if you have mercury fillings in your mouth, that's the single largest source you will ever be exposed to. So to exempt those from the regulations is preposterous, really. I and, and do you know I, I actually I do have to thank Environment Canada and Health Canada because if they had not denied me access to one of the documents that informed the public process, I wouldn't have gotten in touch with Dave and Nestor. Because I, I asked them after they had uh, come out with this idea to exempt mercury fillings, I asked them for a copy of the report from the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. And these gentlemen represent that organization. And it was a public process, but they refused to give me the document. They said it was private. <laughs> so, but in today's world, it's very easy to Google and find that the IAOMT, they're in the head offices in the United States, I believe so. But right away, they said, oh, you must get in touch with Dave, uh, who is right in our next door province. Dave is from Alberta. We had a great conversation. It turns out he was the dentist and knows the family of my niece-in-law. So that was, uh, we, uh, it was most helpful. And I had a copy of the report shortly thereafter. Uh, Nestor is the president of the IAOMT. And um, I don't know how it actually came about. I think it was just like, Dave, you wouldn't consider coming to Saskatoon, would you? <laughs> was it that simple? I think it was, yeah. <laughs> And uh, so I'm just thrilled to be, uh, you know, to, to have uh, Dr. Mark and, and, and uh, Dr. Shapko here uh, representing the IAMT. And I don't want to take a bunch of time because you're here for their information. The, um, there is no organization that organized this event. It is just people. You're part of the organizing of it, uh, your attendance here, and, uh, and, and then I know that we will all be part of finding the solution to the situation with mercury fillings. The, um, the, um, Anna Hunter is going to MC and guide us through the this Citizens' Assembly. Before I pass the mic over to her, there's just one thing that I wanted to place on the table. It, 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 what it is is just information. Like I, I want to understand why it is that we are failing to come up with solutions to very serious problems. If you look at, for example, cancer, at one time the rate of cancer was, you know, one in a thousand people had cancer, and then maybe one in five hundred people, and then one in a hundred, one in fifty. Today they say that one get cancer. Well, the next number after that is one in two people get cancer. 
And cancer is only one of those diseases. We also, as you know, have the world's highest incidence of MS in Saskatchewan. Parkinson's is uh, another disease that we have lots of. And there are developmental problems and there are fertility problems. What we've done is to make those things normal. We've normalized disease and developmental problems. They are not normal. And as an intelligent society, we should be able to figure out how to reverse the trend lines, those trend lines of disease. The, so in, in trying to understand why it is that we are not effectively addressing those things, I, there's a couple of things that, uh, that, I, that I'll touch on over the course of the uh, today and tomorrow. Tonight, I'll just do one of them. And that is that um, I think, first of all, that we need to look at the human immune system. And you, you could say that your immune system is you, because if your immune system fails, you're toast. I mean, there's, you ain't here. <laughs> so the, our immune systems are essential to our health. The, if you then look at, uh, well, let me just phrase the, a question. Like I've been asked, how can you make the statement that mercury fillings cause MS, for example? That question tells the lie of our understanding. The situation is that, you know, I, it, it is not the situation that one poison, mercury, causes MS. It's not the situation that MS is caused only by mercury fillings, for example. The, when your immune system is assaulted by poisons and they're in combination one with the other, and they are attacking different immune systems, you will get different disease outcomes. Your immune system is different from your immune system. Your parents are different, so you've got different genetic makeup. Your life history is different, so you've been exposed to different poisons as you progress through the years. Therefore, you have different weaknesses in your immune system. And so when you have assaults by different poisons, those, the, this, the outcome of those poisons will be different in you and you. And, and they will be different at different times in your life, depending on how your immune system is, where it's at, whether it's strong or weak in different areas. So what you have is, it is it's actually consistent to say, well, you know, that there is, there, yes, there is a connection between a disease like MS and mercury fillings. It doesn't have to be a direct linear relationship that this causes this. No, it's actually a, 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 a number of things working together contribute to this. And not only do they contribute to this disease, but in somebody else, they will come out in some other disease. So I just, I'm gonna stop there. I just want to uh, place that thought or that information on the table. Uh, and I think it will be helpful as we move through the information. Well, yes, sir, by welcoming you and, uh, and thanking each and one of you, every one of you for coming out tonight. We, um, we're not gonna take the, your attendance lightly. We're really, really glad you came. Some of you had to bow snow, ice, hail, and uh, rain. So thank you for that. Um, tonight we're, we're discussing a really, really exciting and important topic. We're taking a novel approach. What we're trying to do is have the scientists, one type of science, dentistry, meet the political scientists and see if we can come up with some, some actual change. That's what we're going to be working towards tomorrow is how do we make this topic, which I have a hard time understanding why it's so a topic. If it's debatable, just get rid of them. Like if there's a debate, just get rid of them. But we're going to be working tomorrow to make groups with a democracy team on how to make the changes once you're persuaded by our panels of experts. And I get to thank, just really quickly, I'll thank Sandra, I'll thank our videotape team, Darren and Rod, um, for working right through dinner time to get this set up. Good. And so tomorrow we start back at 9 in the morning, and we, we will be breaking for lunch, but we're not providing lunch tomorrow, and we'll be doing working groups.
groups, like before lunch and after lunch, and we're hoping you show up. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to President and Dr. Nestor Shaka and David Warwick, and all of them give their own bios and everything like that. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. It changed how I view health and life, and here I am now as the president of this organization that helped uh, bring this information to me. That's Mr. Shaka. I'll turn off the camera. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he was wrong. Uh, my name is Dr. Dave Warwick, and, and I had the pleasure to actually go through dental school at the University of Alberta with Professor. In fact, we lived together for over three years with him. Other couple of dental students, and uh, uh, when we went to Kansas, uh, it was uh, a turning point for, for both of us, and, and it's been a fun ride. And, and, um, and like Nestor says, I think uh, our, we're trying to achieve better health for everybody. That's that's our, our main goal. And that's what we're trying to do. So uh, that's why we're here, and, and we're open to any questions later on. So uh, with that, I think we'll. Uh, uh, I just want to say this is less of a presentation as it is a conversation. So if there's something you need, information, don't be afraid to stop us and get on with the process. Otherwise, you can just fall asleep. So if it's interactive, it's going to be much, much better. Um, first part of the whole presentation, I know it's about Canada. We're here because Mercury literally is one of the most constant substances on the earth. And we're in a situation that uh, globally it threatens us, and yet we are in a position where, as a health profession, it threatens us. Um, we know as fact that mercury represents 50% of what happens as a filling in your um, We also know, as part of the conversation, um, when we do any uh, communication, you have to start with certain ground rules and certain principles. And one of the simple, simplest principles is here in the laws of Canada uh, with regards to the food drug regulations. And that is the organization that would oversee an album as a dental food material. And it's a very good regulations that no person shall sell any device or use the current that shall cause injury. Um, so in the previous slide, knowing that mercury is the most constant stuff that's going, it's 50% of your filling, and we already have as laws that should be there to protect us. Um, as you suggest, it's why we even have this conversation at all. Um, the Consumer's Product Act also has in it what we call the precautionary principle. And what the precautionary principle simply states is, you do not have to have 100% proof that something is wrong in order to take action. And yet with much of the, again, we're on the scientific side, it's the political side that they seem to insist or think that it's not 100% verifiable, it's not 100% beyond doubt, which, again, in science, it's like two football teams. Any given day, who's to say who's going to win? It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about health, we're talking about uh, the safety of, of really the nation. So these are our laws that already exist, and for some reason they've been ignored or not carried forward. And just, uh, just as Sandra said, uh, her talk about uh, how there's a multifactorial uh, effect on, on a lot of diseases. We spent this morning uh, with a group of scientists in, in Calgary, and we were trying to come up with a, with a way or design a study that would prove that mercury fillings were hurting people. And the truth is, it's, it's very difficult, and it's one of the reasons that it's still being used, because, because you can try your best, and uh, like Nestor said, you can 
take numbers, you can take stats, you can design these particular uh, studies to really have an outcome that works on your side. Um, Mercury is very loose and it behaves differently in everybody and in different organ tissues. And, and there's a lot of synergy with different types of uh, other metals such as lead. So just important to understand that uh, it's not so easy to say, okay, we get this much mercury and this is going to happen. It, it, it just doesn't work that way, as, as Sandra said. Um, knowing the first part of this, you have to ask yourself the question, why would dentists ever start putting it in in the first place? And the truth is that they did not. Um, mercury is a product that was brought to North America in 1833. And I had to do some history here thinking about, well, Canada wasn't a confederation until 1867. And I'm not sure what the statute, but Alberta wasn't a province until 1905. So you go back to 1840, there were no dentists. They didn't exist. The first dental school in the world was built in 1840. So all the dentistry was practiced by the medical doctors, who then paid out the dentistry to so start that. Again, if there was no dentists putting it in, how did it come in? Well, the truth is that dentistry was practiced by barbers, traveling salesmen, people who just roamed around doing the best that they could for the people. And that's what really wanted the burger part. So we go back all the way in history, we actually see that the medical side couldn't, did not condone the use of urban medical films. It was the exact opposite. You say, well, then what changed? Well, very simply, in 1840, there were not very many products that you actually could use to restore teeth. So if you had a problem, you took the tooth out of it. If you had half a problem, you didn't really have much to do, it would be very expensive. So I mean, mercury in itself is, again, very easy to use, simple and affordable. So it did become a product of the masses because it needed a product of the masses. Um, in 1845, when, again, the first World Dental Association started, they actually had the members sign a letter saying it was about practice to put in mercury problems. The only problem with that is, though, it's uh, a matter of economics, um, ease, and by 1856, all the dentists who had signed into the association had no patients, or did not have So the society ended up being disbanded, and in its ashes arose the American Dental Association. And what was their mantra? Mercury Valley Films are great. So I mean, we know then that science and health washed out to economics and basically health, you want to call it that. Uh, over 150 years that the American Health Association has been organized, obviously they've taken and created their own science to keep the material going. Um, in doing so, they have to ignore all of the issues that doctors knew up until then about mercury. And so the simple thing that they said was, stuff is stable. Sure, there's mercury in there, but it doesn't do anything, it doesn't go anywhere. So that was their criteria for saying that it was, it was fine. Uh, to simply say that the mercury could not be released, it was stuck in the fillings, was sufficient that they were maintained and literally up until probably the, the 60s or uh, 50s or 60s. How could anybody challenge them? But again, if you think of that technology at the time, uh, there was no technology to really find out the problem. So we know throughout history there are many cases, uh, case reports of, of people who knew and didn't become very toxic. And that's what they always call the controversy when they were about the wars. And they say that simply because the only information you could use was anecdotal. But when this person mentioned they got sick, and wait a minute, you come back and say, my mercury valve fills. Oh no, no, it doesn't count. And everything they do, it doesn't count. Why? Well, because the mercury's gone and it doesn't come out. You couldn't possibly be asking something else. And that's the difficulty of actually suggesting or saying something one specific thing. And again, we're hearing that to this day. Uh, 
Um, here is an electron micrograph of a surface of a mercury come out of the building. And it doesn't take much of a scientist to be able to see on that. Those are droplets of mercury coming out of the building. So when they say that it's bound, it's how can it be bound when it's right there? Uh, this uh, mercury is coming out from a light pressure load. So I mean, it's no different if you have something the ground step on it, water comes up. In this case, because it's mercury, it's mercury. We know as good science that mercury is not stable. In 1991, the World Health Organization acknowledged that the predominant source of human exposure to mercury is from your fillings. That should be of concern to anyone. Though all mercury silver fillings leak substantial amounts of mercury constantly. The amount increases with any kind of stimulation, and as a result, mercury from fillings produces the majority of human exposure to mercury. The International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology is extremely concerned about the anecdotal claims of safety by manufacturers and dental trade associations that are at variance with the published, peer-reviewed scientific evidence to the contrary. The precautionary principle requires action once the possibility of harm exists. It does not require proof beyond a shadow of a doubt that in the case of heavy metal and xenobiotic exposure is both nearly impossible and unnecessary in our opinion. What you're seeing is mercury vapor coming off a 25-year-old silver amalgam filling in an extracted tooth. The background is a phosphorescent screen. The mercury vapor absorbs the fluorescent light and you can see it as a shadow on the screen. This is mercury coming off a filling that was dipped in water that's the same temperature as the human body. This is a filling that was rubbed with a pencil eraser for just a few seconds. Like going to the hygienist and having her clean your teeth. These are not small amounts of mercury. If you can see it, it's more than 1,000 times higher than the Environmental Protection Agency will allow for the air that we breathe. What about the last time you went to the dentist and they drilled on your tooth? Here is the mercury vapor every time you raise the temperature to 110 degrees with hot coffee or warm water or even chewed on it. Mercury comes off fillings every time you stimulate them, and that stimulation causes the mercury to continue to leak out of the fillings for an hour and a half, at a minimum. Some people grind their teeth. Some people chew gum. The dentist might send an old gold crown to the dental lab to be welded. How about the dental personnel? They're not being given informed consent. The environment in Canada, as we speak, knows that mercury bottom is not a stable object. <coughs> and they know that because uh, we have a major push to make sure that no mercury amount enters the environment. So we now have precautions as far as mercury separators in our office. We have precautions as far as any biohazardous waste that has to be collected special and sent to a biohazard. Again, the only way that the mercury model can leave our office is in the mouth. Um, again, the technology finally developed to the point where we can actually measure the amount of mercury coming off. And you saw from the videos that at some point it's still repaired. The industry was forced to change their as a way of minimizing the fact that toxins are entering your body. But when you talk about poisons, or actually any chronic anatomy, it's the dose that makes the poison. So whether it's sugar, salts, you name it, depending on the dose determines whether that material is, in fact, toxic to human health. And that's what we need to do analyze and consider what they about safety. Well, again, getting that mercury is the most toxic of the heavy metals. It's the most toxic of the development. So the governments always set standards, and obviously the protection of this, food, drugs, chemicals, the government sets standards. We that we always need to entire standards of basic knowledge to do that. Discussions, yes, 
poisonous, naturally occurring substance on the planet. It is a powerful neurotoxin, damages the immune system, and directly or indirectly contributes to or makes worse every health issue you will ever deal with. Mercury contributes to memory loss, depression, autism, and plays a role in heart disease, to name but a few. Amalgam silver fillings constantly release toxic mercury vapor much more so when stimulated by anything, including such common actions as toothbrushing. This is illustrated in the following demonstration by Dr. Tom McGuire. Thank <laughs> you. 
A telling demonstration, but what do the numbers actually mean? Remember, mercury vapor in any quantity is poisonous and has profound psychological and physical effects. Here are just some of the psychological and emotional symptoms of chronic mercury poisoning. And here are just some of the physical symptoms of chronic mercury poisoning. In addition, these are some diseases related to chronic mercury poisoning. As well, this is just a partial list of how mercury relates to reproductive disorders. Regardless of a dentist's belief about whether or not mercury amalgam fillings are a health hazard, you have seen that removing them unsafely can generate toxic levels of mercury vapor, exposing the dentist, the dental staff, and the patient. The good news is that safe removal protocols are effective and available, and we believe they should be adopted by all dentists. And the bad news is that today only a small percentage of dentists are using these safe removal protocols. If you are a dentist, the New Directions Dentistry website listed below offers the first and most comprehensive DVD course for minimizing occupational exposure to mercury at the dental office and making your practice mercury safe. If you are a patient, we urge you to let your dentist know about our DVD. For more information about the very real health hazards of mercury amalgam and Dr. Tom McGuire's book, Poison in Your Teeth, visit mercurysafedentists.com. There you'll also find the largest, most comprehensive online directory of mercury safe dentists. And thank you for watching. Yeah, so if you, uh, that, that was still important uh, about two years ago, and it's an excellent DVD. If there's anybody here that is a dentist that uh, is looking for a safe, safe way to deliver, to remove mercury fillings, it's an awesome overview to get you started uh, in, in that task and, and stop harming you know, patients and yourself and your, and your staff. Um, just so you have a reference point. Right now, occupational health and safety has a maximum allowable ceiling, meaning you're not to go above that ever if you're in the room or you're breathing that air of 100 micrograms. So from the video and the demonstrations, you can see how easy it was or would be to exceed a ceiling. The ambient air is, again, 0 0.025, uh, I think that's for an eight hour day. So we're talking about occupation, so we can remember an eight hour day. So that is how low the number is for eight hour exposure. So again, that's why, again, when you think about any of those procedures, hot coffee, grinding, the numbers easily exceed what's already on the books as laws. Uh, I guess the other thing I would just add to Nestor is that uh, that one, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a 0.1 uh, milligram uh, or 100 micrograms is the ceiling rate for the EPA. Uh, Alberta has a ceiling of 125 uh, micrograms.
milligrams or 0.125 milligrams. Uh, Saskatchewan doesn't list in their hazardous uh, materials that I could find on the website um, a ceiling rate, so it would kick into the Canadian um, ceiling, which is uh, 150 micrograms. So there are a little bits of differences in, in the ceiling rate, but you also have to understand that just the in all of the hazardous materials tables, um, it's not just inhalation that we're worried about because mercury vapor is known as, as a, a vapor that can be absorbed through the skin. So you, you can't really have your hands anywhere near that or your fingers or your air arms or you run the risk of uptake of mercury as well. So those, those limits um, do apply to their skin as well with, with mercury vapor. With this slide here, and I apologize because this should be this. Um, here we are that the government says for safe drinking water, we should not have more than one microgram per liter. Now that's based on a two liter consumption of water per day. And on the plane right over here, we're talking, and Dave was reminding me that there's a study on mercury content of saliva that mercury bottom bearers have. And it, it's four, four micrograms is the very low end per liter of, of mercury in saliva. Um, and it can go up to 22 micrograms. And we do drink somewhere in the range of one to one and a half liters of our own saliva. So in effect, we're, we're drinking a toxic substance uh, when we have a mountain filling. So they would be, they would be undrinkable and, and labeled unsafe to drink. It's a yeah. lot of saliva. A lot of this is just to show you what dental associations are dentists say. It's only a small amount now. You can get the picture that small amount doesn't mean the same. Even for paint, you can't put mercury in paint. It's there as a contaminant, so they have to have a MAC for it. But yet, we put it in people's mouths. Um, if you do the math on what the, obviously, if they're calling it safe, this is what we end up with. That all those small numbers, with the exception of the one product, that is actually a plant in the body. Have you gentlemen made this presentation to uh, like the higher authorities, like Health Canada or Canadian Dental Association? Or? Absolutely. Not the presentation so much as we brought this information forward, brought the science forward. But there's not a lot of science for sure yet, simply because again, it's a conversation to get the process going. And what's their response? It's it's um, one of the passing the buck right now, but we're still in the process of we're going to we're going to go through a, a part of this um, that we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Yes. That's only inorganic mercury. If you mix it with staph, uh, and you get methyl mercury, which is a thousand times more toxic. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Mix it with the bacteria, which right. is normally found. I didn't, I didn't look at the presentation, but it's one of the excuses they also used. They seem to want to minimize elemental mercury and say, oh, well, but it's not methyl mercury, which is more poisonous. And yet we have studies showing how mercury from amalgam was methylated in the environment. Or in the environment. So, in that, the so that's why they're saying, well, we can't have a different environment. But what they don't realize, we are an environment with ourselves. And the studies show that we do methylate the mercury in our own bodies, in our guts, in our mouth, because we have the same bacteria, we have the same types of flora, they do the same thing. But they won't accept that because now and again, they have to look at the methyl mercury side of it, which they're already ignoring everything before. But then we, we, we talk in terms of, of, of inorganic mercury because that's what's coming off of the that's um, that's a start. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone knows that they don't eat the fish. And that's why again, the entire world is the United Nations coming out with the uh, environmental program to stop the local pollution. And why? So we can save the fish. And when we actually look at, and this is from 1991 when the World Health Organization did uh, their first study on, on mercury, 
when you look at the sources, uh, we're not getting that much from air. This is a body room. You're not getting that much from water. Yes, we're going to get from foods. But we also know as fact that 80% of the average, up to 80% of the average person's living water room comes from the amount of foods. So anytime they want to say, don't eat the fish, don't, 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 but there's no conversation to don't go to the amount of This first alloy is one of the brands of amalgam that I used to use. And we get product manufacturer sheets on all our products. And specifically, they say it's contraindicated for expected mothers, children, patients with severe renal deficiency, and that's kidneys, because mercury is known and accepted to damage the kidneys. Uh, people that are allergic to mercury, and when you have metals to metals. So that's what the, you know, the physical that would be similar metals. In 1996, Health Canada was asked to revisit the idea of having an album on the market. And so they convened a committee to do just that. And they came up with this great and amazing list of recommendations. However, these recommendations were already known for contraindications. For children, for pregnant females, for kidney patients, should not be used uh, for precautions when you're using the treatments, not for allergic patients, and not in contact with other metals. So they never really came up with something new, but they made it sound like they were doing something important. Uh, the only real difference that they said it made different was patients have the right to decline treatment for the material. And yet we know that there are populations that don't have that choice. Medical services will only pay for mercury amalgams in posterior restorations. So again, the country is, I call it not here, it's just, it just it doesn't make any sense. Just go back to the other slide here, Esther. Um, just to answer your question, we have been going through each one of these points and emailing and, and sending hard copy letters to our chief dental officer in Canada. Um, and we so far have sent um, the pregnant uh, females, the children. Um, we haven't quite sent the kidney, they might be going soon. Um, we've done some work on some of the newer science and the risks involved in different medical um, situations. The answer to, to our letters is essentially that the chief dental officer is not uh, responsible or accountable for um, making these integrated into our society, because they're not. For example, um, since 1996 when this came out, um, for sure, there's been an average of 330,000 amount of put into total just in Quebec alone. Um, Mark Richardson is not going to the exact number of how many mercury fillings have been put into children since 1996. Many, many times you'll see, you'll see gold crowns in contact or braces in contact with, with amalgam fillings. That creates a galvanism or electricity, which increases the vaporization of the mercury out. So we see these things broken all of the time. They're not being held, uh, they're, they're not being followed, and they're putting people at increased risk. We know that because South Canada said it. So our challenge, and this may be an action, is to continue to, to press for just trying to mandate Health Canada to integrate and assimilate the recommendations that they made in 1996. Is that the Richardson report? That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, I was always wondering why they didn't uphold it. Yeah. And then Vindy's work before that. Correct. The University of Calgary. How come that's not in the What happened with the Richardson report is if you're doing a substance, if you're doing an assessment, the risk assessment is the correct way to do it. So Mark did the risk assessment. They didn't like the answer they got. Yeah. So what did they do? They brought in all these experts so-called experts, but experts, to then go through his risk assessment and tear it apart. Well, he had done 30, 60, 100 prior to that. 
not aware of it. You, as soon as you touch this one, and so within the actual guidelines, there is a specific statement saying, well, some of the conclusions you draw there were not so just left it aside. But it's a good study. Again, politics entered the arena of science, science lost out, and basically he just got put aside. Great. Um, so basically what Al Kennedy is doing is saying that things are safe. It doesn't matter who and where or why. Yet the contraindications were there prior to them even starting the recommendations. Put the recommendations in place and they're still ignored almost 100%. Uh, one of the world's leading authorities is Professor Mats Berlin. He's Professor Emeritus of Environmental Medicine in Sweden. He led two World Health Organization, that's World Health Organization conferences on Mercury. So he didn't get to be the chair because he was a so-called expert, he actually is an expert. And when the Swedish government started to look at that, they asked him to do a report for them, which came out in 2002. Um, Obviously, his testimony is very simple, that we're realizing that the amount of mercury it takes to see actual effects is decreasing over time, and now the margin of safety is no longer there. This is, again, a simple slide. You can see from the diagonal downwards from 1970 to 2000 how, as we get smarter, as we have better technology to actually measure these, as we have better technology to actually assess patients and health, the numbers keep getting lower and lower and lower and lower for mercury as far as how much you're actually allowed to have in the body with other effects. And yet here we have a very important piece of information right from the World Health Organization, the paper on mercury in healthcare. Mercury is highly toxic. Recent studies suggest that mercury may have no threshold below which some adverse effects do not occur. So this is coming already from the World Health Organization. Lower down in this paper, it specifically says dental amalgam is the single largest source that you have. Yet if you go to the World Health Organization and ask them about mercury amalgam, what's their answer? It's safe and effective. In 2006, we had, uh, the AMT had literally taken a lawsuit to the United States because they have never classified the mercury in the United States. So the FDA created what they call the white paper. They list the studies saying, this study shows it's safe, this study shows it's compiled into this document called the white paper. And they put it to an independent panel to review which they hoped to pass. Their own handpicked panel of experts looked at the data and specifically says, I'm sorry, there's not enough information here to prove the stuff is actually safe. So thank you, their own community had enough. Pause. Thank you. <laughs> to, to stand up and say no. They didn't say it wasn't safe because they weren't asked that question. But they definitely answered the question, it's not a reasonable conclusion to say it's safe. Mm -hmm. Two years later, they magically declared it safe anyways, mm -hmm. without any restrictions. So we petitioned them again, and then they granted us the petition, and we commissioned a new risk assessment. Um, because the old one that was done was in 1996 in North Canada. And this was 2010, so 14 years later. On the American On the American Mark Richardson did this for us as well. And then once again, they convened the committee, handpicked by the FDA, which likes the amount. And again, this committee came to the conclusion that it should not be used in pregnant women, it should not be used in kids. So again, it's the same mantra. Uh, today, this is 2012, and we still have not had a room in lines. So, again, it's just, it's difficult to get into the room. 
in this slide you'll see it's 2005, and I'm sure this is still current in 2012. But the Canadian Dental Association has their blank statement. Scientific evidence indicates no significant risks are involved. So everything I've said to you up until, the, up until then obviously means nothing to them. All the panels speaking means nothing to them. All the science means nothing to them. Yet they say scientific evidence indicates no risks. That's for men. And specifically talking here again to the growing brain. So it should not be used in children and for children. Sweden and Norway themselves have ended the use of amalgam in their countries. Now, Sweden did it, and was lucky to do it because masking rent was. Uh, 13. Less than a team member, and even now. I'm led to believe that it was not until medical ethicists entered the picture in the political scene, meaning people who were actually concerned with moral and ethical values of putting mercury to people, that this change occurred. In Norway, they're very quiet about this. We have almost no literature of why Norway did it. But we know as fact that, uh, and I call it, they don't have a name, but a dental assistant. Right after World War II, there was no great health care. So in Norway and some of these countries, bang, it was government, health care, no problem. Dentistry, no problem. So they recruited hundreds if not thousands of dental assistants or nurses to mix, place, and fill the teeth of the population now that they have this wonderful technology. And many of these dental assistants became poisoned. And it was through the efforts of one of the dental assistants over and over and over and over advocacy that someone in government finally listened, believed her story, and we had Norway also jumped on board as far as that. But again, you won't find almost nothing in the literature to that effect. Yeah, literally, literally in Norway, uh, the, the end of the use, on Wednesday, the dentist went to work and put the fillings in. On Thursday, they got a note that says no more. And it was just like that. Um, and, and it didn't have anything to do with science. I'll tell you that, probably. Uh, those nurses had fertility problems. Correct. <laughs> At least uh, lots of neurological issues. It was a great movie on that. Yes, any more masculine than specifically saying because of the certain actions, this time the bio, biochemical dynamics in the cell and the hobbies no longer unacceptable restriction. Now I put these in that in front of Athens that I didn't even pass. To this day, if you ask dental societies, if you ask dental institutions, mercury was banned in Sweden because of environmental concerns. Not once will they stand up and actually read the report where I've put over and over and over. There are real health reasons that are used for not using the remodel. This is from the International Occupational Safety Health Information Center from 1999. Long term exposure to heavy metals may result in slow, progressing physical, muscular, and neurological degenerative processes that mimic. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, muscular dystrophy, and multiple sclerosis. Allergies are not uncommon and repeated long term contact with some metals or other compounds that even cause cancer. Now, again, I'm not sure where they ever can suggest there isn't the issue of health potential, deleterious health potential effects. Um, it's been known for a long time. Masculine, again, specifically saying if you have a disease state or an autoimmune disease, he doesn't say go look for plastics, he doesn't say go look for lead, or he's telling you to look specifically for mercury release from God. So for him to say this statement is profound in itself. And that gets down to what we suggested before. It's hard to pin that down, but he has physically said that. 
Mark Houston, who is a cardiologist, uh, has been doing obviously his research. Again, specifically saying mercury toxicity needs to be evaluated in anyone that has unknown reasons for any cardiovascular diseases. So again, that's very specific. Does anyone in our government or healthcare actually care? Again, I go back to we already have it as laws that you shouldn't have to prove something to be against the degree of intimacy. You shouldn't have to not use the precautionary principle that says, in case of any doubt, err on the side of the caution. Um, dentistry, I always have a problem saying it was preventative based. I don't understand why, with all this evidence, they still choose to prevent it all because that's not prevention. Um, it doesn't get any simpler than that. For medical reasons, the value needs to be stopped. And again, here we are, still in 2009, saying dental amalgam is considered safe, affordable, and durable. Right at the same time that they have the goal, it's a little more focused on the upper top of you, but here's the AD logo called AD Accepted Approved. Almost next to the stone of crossbones. <laughs> That's an amalgam container. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Another lawsuits with regards to the amalgam. And in one of them, they were named as. What is the defendant? Yeah. yeah. This was their statement in the lawsuit. Basically, it says the EDA owes no legal duty of care to protect the public from allegedly dangerous materials. The ADA's only alleged involvement in the product it just has to was to provide information regarding its use. Dissemination of information related to the practice of dentistry does not create a duty of care to protect the public from injury. And what many of us forget to understand is the Canadian Dental Association and the American Dental Association are trade organizations. They're not health organizations, but they're trade organizations. And the American Dental Association has over 155,000 members. So you can believe they have a lot of power and they have a lot of clout. Should we maybe take a break right now? And, and it's durable, it's effective, it's cheap, and they've used it for 160 or 170 years. That's the only answer I can give you that makes any sense. And because they can. What do they use in Sweden and Norway? We have within our academy members that have been members for 25, 30 years and have never placed in the Mercury Mountain filling. Uh, some of them are retired, never placed in the Mercury Mountain filling. You can use composites, you can use ceramics, and you can even use gold. It is doable. I mean, Dave probably hasn't placed one almost ever. And I was placing them up until 2005, uh, so I haven't placed one since. So yes. to, to answer your question, though, I think there's a little bit more depth to that question. Um, and, and there's always speculation on the side of the people that do support the organization, that do support the use of amalgam. And one of them is the risk of legality. And because they maintain the safety through all of what you've seen, there's much, much more than this. We didn't get into the science of the harm that is being created. Um, so they have to maintain safety because they have to save face and in the light of all the information that's come up. If they all of a sudden say it's not safe, what happens? So yeah, it's a litigation. Yeah. Now what's what's concerning is right now there's a massive move uh, globally to to form a, a tree, a legally binding tree to, to reduce the amount of mercury containing products. Uh, right now amalgam is kind of quasi exempt from that as as per standards on 